Okay, I'd like to call a uh, meeting of the Citizens Transportation Safety Advisory Committee to order. Um, our first item of agenda is, yeah, do you have to keep holding it the whole time you're talking? Okay. Our first item is approval of the uh, discussion approval of the minutes from the last meeting. And I do understand the last meeting we did not have a recording, so staff was somewhat uh, going by what their collective memory was of what was said. So if it seems a little uh, sketchy to people that were there, they, it's based on what they could uh, recover. So do I have anybody that would like to make any comments on the minutes? You gotta push the button when you talk, remember. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, item number six, page uh, three. They're not numbered. Are they numbered? Anyhow, item number six. That's the info an automated enforcement safety program. Yeah, paragraph number two, three on that section. Okay, I just want to, uh, because it's not reflected in the minutes, I want to elaborate, I guess, again, on what I had asked for when that we had that discussion. It was, it was indicated that the so-called uh, multi-jurisdictional intersections were not part of the analysis of accidents and everything related to that. Uh, so I asked the question, how many multi-jurisdictional intersections with traffic lights are there? Um, because I'm particularly curious what percentage of signalized intersections that represents in the city as a whole uh, because that's going to tell us i think what percentage of intersections were not even considered when it came to an analysis of accident rates and again uh, just because i mentioned this last our last meeting with the belief on my part that th these are inter these are intersections that don't necessarily have vigorous enforcement because they're kind of like in no man's land. They're between they're, they're multi jurisdictional. So this is something I'm really interested in. And to get to some of these other questions, I need answers to the basic, which is how many intersections are there, and what percentage does that represent in terms of total signalized intersections in the city. Brianna, do you think we can get that by the next meeting? Or whenever, you know, I mean, it's not. Um, Chair Callow, uh, absolutely, we can make sure we get that. And just, I do want to clarify when we talk about multi-jurisdictional, there is one jurisdiction that typically operates the signal. So um, sometimes you may have three jurisdictions on, you know, three of the four corners, and one does take the lead in terms of operation and maintenance sure. of the signals. And so we would identify those where, they border with other cities, um, and we would identify who is the responsible party to operate and maintain that specific signal. So we can put that together. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, but in, in the final analysis, all I'm really looking for is which ones were not included in the analysis of accident rates. And, and, and what I think what we were told was none of the multi-jurisdictional ones were because you can't calculate did it happen on the Scottsdale side, did it happen on the Phoenix side, you know, who's responsible maybe for the maintenance of the intersection. I, I, I get all that. I get, I get, I understand why it, it, it doesn't fit neatly into the analysis of those jurisdictions or those jurisdictions that are within the confines of the city itself. But I am alarmed by the fact, I mean, I don't know what kind of, we, we apparently we don't know what the rate of incidents are there because it's not part of the analysis. So we'll get to that, I guess. Yes, so, and we will uh, do our best. I, th I think that's something we could have by the December meeting, and so we'll, that will be our Great. goal. Thank you. I know uh, of what you speak. I live up in, uh, in the northeast part of the valley, and I know that the, the intersections at, on Scottsdale Road are multi-jurisdictional from Bell South, and I do tend to get the feeling that I'll never see a police officer between 64th Street and Scottsdale Road because they don't want to go down there and have to turn around and come back. So it's kind of like a... A, a, a speeding zone you know? in both communities right <laughs> you know i mean I, I it's it's just yeah it's just i wouldn't say it's human nature but it's a practical use of, of limited law enforcement resources i, uh, I think scottsdale road has come that. because scottsdale road is theirs and they do maintain they do enforcement on that okay so, but yeah. from the phoenix perspective it's a dead-end street <laughs> right 
Any other comments? Yeah, um, there was a discussion about um, creating a subcommittee for to take a look at that uh, item, and uh, it led to the discussion, or added to the discussion of just having subcommittees in general. Um, maybe I'm missing it, but I didn't see it in the um, in uh, uh, I didn't see it on here. So um, you know, we we had a discussion. I believe there was uh, although we couldn't take any votes or anything. There was a consensus that um, the uh, that the committee wanted to be able to create a subcommittee to be able to look at this and um, and report back to the full committee and um, you know we asked about how that was uh, how that was to be done and then staff said that they were um, that they would you know get that done for hopefully for our next meeting of course it hasn't happened but we'll talk more about that during the other thing but as far as you know what's on the minutes um, there was a discussion about that and a, and a generalized consensus that that would be a good idea to get more information. Jay, when you say to talk about this, are you talking about the jur multi-jurisdictional intersections? No, I'm talking about just automated question in general. It's just oh, okay. this item. Thank you for clarifying. Um, but yeah, we you know we did have that discussion, and and it doesn't seem to be reflected in the minutes. Um, Chair Callow and Committee Member Bieber, um, if you look at uh, Director's Update un under Number Three, the very last one. It does say committee member Bieber followed up with a request to amend city code to allow the committee to create subcommittees. So it does have that sentence. It does have it in that section, but we also discussed it under this item. And specifically, there was a discussion uh, from the committee members to uh, one of the reasons we wanted the, the ability to do that was for an item such as this, which was very complicated and had a lot of moving parts and a lot of things associated with it, and that we wouldn't have time in a meeting like this to go through all of the things and that a subcommittee for this type of issue would be appropriate. And so we did have that discussion during that particular item and it's not reflected in the minutes. Committee member Bieber, so are you asking us to, um, under item six, automated enforcement, would you like us to reflect the meeting minutes to reflect committee member Bieber, um, again, requested to, um, be allowed to create subcommittees within the committee to specifically uh, discuss the automated enforcement pieces. Would that be reasonable? Yes, and I think it would also be reasonable that there was a general consensus from the group. I don't know how you want to reflect that, um, but that there was a general agreement from other members, and I can't tell you who said what or anything like that because we don't have a reporting. Um, I know Mr. Farley agreed to, to it, and a number of other people said, "Yeah, that might be a good idea." So. You know, again, we did, it wasn't an action item. We couldn't take and we couldn't take a vote on anything. We couldn't formalize anything. So, um, I'm, you know, it was just a generalized discussion and, and generalized feeling. Nobody, it's, nobody seemed to object to it. I don't okay. want to say it that way. I, I, you know, and, and we can make sure that the minutes reflect that there was a general consensus of the committee members um, to move forward with that recommendation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other items on the minutes that anyone wants to comment on? Everybody out in the uh, internet land there, I see two people's faces and a couple of names. Okay. Oh, I'm good. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're good? <laughs> I'm good. Okay. I'm here. I'm good. Okay, we got three goods. Let's go and move on to item three. Uh, hearing no more comments or discussion on, on item two uh, will be the director's update. Standing in for uh, Kenny Knutson tonight will be Eric Froberg, our city engineer, I understand. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I did see Eric for the first time at Kenny's retirement the other day, so I have seen him before. So uh, just an item of clarification before we move on. Uh, was there actually a vote on number two in the meeting minutes or? It was not a vote. No, tonight, is, yeah. Are you asking for tonight? No, no. no. Yeah, when we had the to, to approve these. Yeah, we didn't actually do a vote to, to approve this. Okay, I call for someone to uh, approve. I, I approve to move as, as amended. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Same thing? Nope. Okay, it's approved. Sorry, Eric. Nope. Just wanted to make sure. It's a discussion of possible action. It was the only. <laughs> yeah. Want to make sure we're just uh, getting all the. T's crossed and I's dotted. All right, well, 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, yes, as, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Chair, my name is Eric Froberg. I'm the city engineer with the city of Phoenix uh, and effective Monday. I will be the interim transportation director as well. So I will be uh, I'll be the middleman between uh, Keeney, who's retiring tomorrow, and then uh, Mr. Joseph Brown, who will be coming uh, in November. Uh, so I will just say right off uh, as we're going forward, I have some limited knowledge of what the first couple meetings were, so I may not be able to answer some of your questions, but we can bring those answers back to you. So if you be patient with me, uh, we'll, we'll be able to, to get along here well. So, but just a little background on myself. I've been the city engineer for just about five years now. Uh, I've been, I've, I've served in a few different roles. I was interim water services director for about six months. And most recently I was uh, interim public works director for about four months. Uh, and then, as we mentioned, for about a month, uh, I'll be interim street transportation director. So uh, I've done a few different things, and I think it gives me a, a good idea as city engineer, right, how the different departments work and those types of things. But uh, all of the, even with all of those other interim things, I've always been in streets, so I, I'm very close to uh, many of these things. So for the director's updates, I just have a few items here. Wanted just to point out in your packet uh, that there is a kind of short little um, summary about uh, Mr. Joseph Brown. Uh, he will be coming here, uh, joining us uh, November 20th. He does have 30 years of diverse management and engineering experience. I won't read this to you, but I wanted to point out a couple of things in his bio here that uh, he does have a proven track record of improving roadway safety, and he is a strong advocate for the Vision Zero and Complete Street. So I thought that was uh, worth just identifying here into this committee. Uh, also have another introduction today. Uh, Melissa Orlandini is here. So uh, she uh, started uh, just this week uh, as our uh, new pedestrian safety coordinator in the traffic services department. So she'll be working very closely uh, with the traffic services department and this committee uh, with any um, questions or concerns that you may have. Now it's going to it's been a week, so let's give her a little time to get kind of caught up on things. Uh, but um, been Melissa, three you, days. Three days, okay. So, but if you'd like to, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I have my entire career has been in public service um, in the transportation industry. It's something I'm extremely passionate about. Uh, and uh, City of Phoenix aligns with some a lot of my own personal values of. Um, coming up with innovative ways to address solutions, um, prioritizing uh, safety, um, and, and the way that we engage with community is something that I have never seen before uh, in an organization that I've worked for. So I'm, I'm really, truly thrilled to be here um, and to, to get to work with you all moving forward. Um, did they get my bio? Okay, good. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and the last line says, um, <clears throat> I hate onions, and that's the hill that I would die on. So I'm just really thankful <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that that was not put in a professional packet. Right. But, but it's you on just the outed yourself. Now. Right. Yeah. You just For all record. of us who love onions, I don't know. All right. I'm going to stop gonna talking together. right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet y'all. Uh, and again, look forward to working with you. Thank you, Melissa. Melissa, may I ask, are you, are you new to the Phoenix metro area? or did? I sure am. Okay. Um, Three days in the office and a month in the state. Where, where are you from? I originally grew up in central Pennsylvania yeah. um, and then spent some time with Washington State Department of Transportation in their traffic safety office. Where in Pennsylvania? Sweetest place on earth, Hershey. Oh, nice. Yeah. Don't expect <laughs> You missed the summer of record, so you were lucky there. <laughs> I'm looking forward to 70 degrees in February, I'll tell you what. That's how I ended up out on the on the West Coast. I got tired of New Jersey uh, weather. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Melissa. A uh, few more updates. Uh, I know that there was a uh, request at the last meeting about subcommittees and a request to have subcommittees. I uh, just wanted to let you know, and I know that there was uh, some conversation about why it's not on the agenda and those types of things. Wanted to let you know that the executive task force met on October 2nd to consider this request. Uh, but at this time, that request cannot be approved based on limited staffing uh, and being the, the city having to staff uh, additional meetings and subcommittees. So 
uh, that at this point, um, it is not an approved request, but can be re-requested in the future. I don't know when that would be, um, but at, at this point, that isn't something that the executive task force was um, interested in, in approving. Uh, second update, uh, just for your information, uh, at the TIP subcommittee, the transportation subcommittee, uh, some speed limit changes, uh, some changes to the speed limit ordinance uh, were brought forward. There were 15 different locations uh, considered. 12 of them had speed limit reductions. Three of them were just for record keeping purposes to make sure that the ordinance was up to date. Um, it did go to consent that, like I said uh, yesterday, uh, or TIP, it was on consent for the TIP meeting yesterday. It was approved four to zero with one caveat that when it goes into the council packet, because it talks about that there were studies that go along with this to show, um, but the studies weren't included in the TIP uh, packet. So uh, the TIP present, the TIP members asked that they be included in the overall packet as it goes forward, right? The justification about why these would be lowered. Um, and then uh, the third thing is about um, also at the, and the automated enforcement, which I know you guys talked about at the last meeting, um, the presentations have continued. It went to the public safety and justice subcommittee on the 4th. Uh, that was for information only. And then yesterday, again, at the TIP subcommittee on the 18th, uh, it was presented again. Uh, there was some action. There was a request by some of the council or by some of the, I guess, um, committee members uh, to further develop a plan. Uh, because it was pretty general about what was being included. Uh, so the request was to further develop a, a plan and then return to TIP with a more kind of flushed out plan, which we will be doing. Um, I, I, I suspect that it would take us a little bit or take the streets department a little bit to be able to formulate that plan, uh, but we will be bringing it back to TIP uh, just as quickly as we can. So uh, Mr. Chair, that's uh, my director updates. What do you remember? Committee has questions about that particular item. Jay, you may. As you may imagine, I have some questions about this particular item. Um, so uh, with regards to the um, subcommittee issue, um, again, th this is this is a situation and this is why I asked for this to be for the for that particular item to be an action item. Um, and I think this is a perfect example of why that's a problem that it's not here because our committee here cannot have a full discussion on it. We can't have a vote. We can't say we would like to, you know, we would like to vote to send a letter or a request or in any way take an action on a uh, something that we requested, which was denied. And I, quite frankly, I think it, the denial is, um, is, is, I don't know why a subcommittee uh, that may meet virtually, okay, perhaps most likely, um, would need staff or anybody else um, or a, a large amount of, of resources for the city, okay? If this committee or any committee, any citizens committee is going to be effective, it needs to have data. It needs to have, needs to be able to meet. It needs to be able to have full discussions on things, okay? Now, if the, if the goal of the city is to have this uh, group be a rubber stamp and just sit here and, and hear updates and stuff like that, sure, that's great. And, you know, everybody can waste their time on that. Okay, but that's not why um, I got involved in these issues, and I'm sure it's uh, not the reason why staff is doing their jobs, which is to just be a rubber stamp for things. I'm sure you guys sit down and you discuss things and you fully flesh things out. This is not a criticism of you in, in any way. Um, but I think that if this group is going to be effective, okay, and to, and to make good decisions, not just sort of things that sound good or whatever is presented and sort of a surfacey way, and I have to be honest, the, the, um, just as the transportation committee, subcommittee rather, felt that the, that the presentation from streets on the automated enforcement was somewhat surfacey, and it may have been appropriate at that time because things are early in the stage, um, they wanted to get more information, okay? We certainly felt that, and in fact, our presentation was even less robust than what the uh, transportation subcommittee got. So. Um, so I would like, and I don't know what's appropriate at this point. I don't know if there's any other discussion from my fellow members on this, but, um, you know, you can say we can make the request, you know, again, I, I would like to make the, I would like a real full understanding of why this was denied, what the supposed costs are, um, and, and why 
it's felt that we can't have the ability to fully immerse ourselves in an issue and then bring information back to this um, committee since this committee meets every two months. It's not like other committees. It's not like other groups that can meet frequently and have the time to discuss these things. I know I'm taking a lot of time and I apologize for that, but I think it's a, an important, uh, I think it's an important issue. Um, and so um, I don't know whether any of my other fellow members want to want to speak on this issue, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm perturbed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've got some cool. comments as well. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to step on anybody's toes there. No, but, that's um, a, I think that's the way you have to do it. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Good to know. Yeah, the th whole thing on this is I think you know from the last meeting where I did not have a good connection. I've got a lot of experience on this, and it's a complex issue. You, can, you can't give an elevator speech and understand all of the underlying issues relating to automated enforcement. And there's a lot of problems with it. Um, and that's why we need the, the ability uh, with fewer members as a subcommittee to delve into it deeper so folks have a real understanding of what's going on. That's it. I just have one question. How is a subcommittee going to present to the full committee without it being somewhat of the same thing where the full committee doesn't get the data and they are expected to accept the results of the subcommittee when the subcommittee is not accepting the results of the streets department. I, I, I'm missing the connection there of what I, putting I, another layer of right. in between the decision making and the presenters is going to gain us. Well, I, th I think that, the, you know, I mean, I've been involved in subcommittees. Um, the state of California has a, um, a committee which is called the uh, Traffic Control Devices Committee. And they've created subcommittees of members of the of the full, of the full committee, and the committee comes back and it makes a report. Now they can have discussions; they have you know abilities to to ask questions and things like that. I'm not; I don't know that 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 the subcommittee is going to say you know we should do this or we shouldn't do this or you know maybe there would be a recommendation, maybe there wouldn't. But I think that. Um, at any, whatever level it is, whether you want to do it at the level of a subcommittee or you want to do it at the level of this committee, um, the amount of data and amount of information in order for this committee, if it's going to take any position whatsoever, um, is immense. And if we could have a, you know, we can have a, a three or four hour meeting just on that alone. And I don't know if anybody wants to do that. But um, if you want to take one of our six meetings a year and just discuss that for three hours. I'll skip that one. Okay, so <laughs> so that's why I that's the, the the goal was to kind of not burden the committee, the full committee, and all the hours it takes for everybody to be here. I just and don't to be able to have that, and that's you know, I mean, I, I don't know how else we would do it. I'm certainly open to another suggestion as to um, as to how we would be able to fully immerse ourselves in in a discussion. I, I understand what you're saying about needing more. Uh, time to digest data, but then at, at, at what point, let's say I'm not on the subcommittee, and then you come back, and my, I don't have the data that you looked at, but I could ask staff for it. I don't, I don't get where that's helping me as a, as a staff member. Well, I would think that- I'm that, assuming that you're telling me something based on data that they didn't tell me based on data. Well, I mean, I think that, I think that if the subcommittee were to work appropriately, it, was gonna, it would bring back data. I mean, it wouldn't just be, it wouldn't just be a, hey, this is what we think. I mean, I, I think that any group or any subcommittee that's bringing back information to a full committee um, can, you know, is, is expected to be able to back up anything that they're saying, even if it is a recommendation or just a generalized, well, here, here's this information, here's this information, here's that information. So, I, you know, I don't know, but again, I don't know how else to parse it. But, um, but I, I, again, I think it, Sounds like, and maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. It sounds like there's a concern that the subcommittee will have an agenda that the rest of the group doesn't have that agenda. It's like the full group is still free to make and ask any questions they want, or or base their decisions on whatever information <coughs> they have or don't have. Well, that, I think it's the latter. I, I I don't know how. Let's say the subcommittee is three people, and and they do something. How, how the rest of the committee is supposed to accept what they say any more than they accepted what staff said based on the information available to everybody. So anyway, I, I, I'll get I off have, my horse there. I have a couple of questions. I have a question down on the end down here. And I forgot your oh, name. Uh, Jamie. 
Um, I just wanted to add on that I agree with uh, Jay on creating subcommittees. I think it's an excellent way that we can really, if we can't meet monthly like we were trying to get, I think it's another way that we can help uh, identify the data and really target certain things that maybe the committee is not 100% focused on uh, while the subcommittee is able to really hone in on those very specific things. That's okay, all. well, as a staff today, we have to have a staff to go back to the executive committee and, and I would say voice a concern that there are still some committee members that are very upset about that decision and would like it to be either reconsidered or more feedback from some of the executive staff as to why they're, they don't want to do it. Just so. a couple of comments, please. Here. Yes. Uh, Sorry. Well, it was my, did I want to ask Eric Frober, uh, was my understanding that you said that the um, automated uh, enforcement was going to go back to TIP, but there was, you were going to have to you delve into that a little bit more for, to kind of fine tune it. Is that my understanding? Uh, that is correct. So I'd like to suggest that maybe some, some, you know, we have the opportunity to participate in that process to get some insight from the community, the, the committee. Um, that might be one way um, some of us might be able to make a contribution or, you know, obtain that extra information that we're all asking for, you know, not, not instead of, you know, creating subcommittees, but, you know, in addition to, um, I think it might be, you know, worthwhile to see if any of us would like to participate in that. Come on, green lights, stay on. Would it be normal for you to come back to this committee or could you come back to this committee before you go back to the subcommittee? I think that's the real request there. Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, subcommittee. Uh, yeah, that's definitely something that we can plan to do uh, okay. and we could come back to this group. I mean, it would help us, right? Then when we go to TIP, we can say, well, we talked to the Vision Zero subcommittee and this is the concerns that they had or the input that they had, right? It's just more data for then the TIP subcommittee to be able to make a decision going forward, right? So yeah, I, I think that would be appropriate as a future uh, agenda item for this subcommittee. And just to the to the other the other question, I, I would recommend, and I know that there's been some discussion about whether we should or shouldn't have subcommittees on this. I think the way to do that is to just have that topic be a future agenda item, and then you could have someone from the executive task force actually come and talk about why the decision was made because I'm not, I don't know why the, all I know that they met and that was the decision that was made. So I'm, sure. I'm not at a liberty to speculate about why they made that decision. I appreciate that. And, and yeah, that, that I think when I, when I sent my email about why it wasn't on the, on the agenda, that was sort of what I was like, yeah, we kind of, I mean, it, especially now knowing that it was denied, <laughs> I think it was even more important that it should have been on the agenda. Um, I have one other question for your um, from from your report. Um, it had to do with the speed limits. Um, so there was a discussion at the, at, uh, the transportation committee um, that um, that when such a report is brought to the subcommittee, that's usually where where it goes first before it goes to the full council. That that it, I mean these studies can be very long. This traffic study can be very long. So to have you know within the report links to that online so any members of the public who want to look at that and in case they have a comment on it whether they agree or disagree or whatever um and this is more a question of transparency um i think not only on that subject but any time that streets can um provide the public with as much information as, as is reasonable and obviously you can't put everything in a package or whatever but to have links to those kinds of things especially when something's referenced in there i think would just be generalized good practice and um you know as far as you know i don't know when that item is going to council it's probably a, you know fairly soon or whatever but it would be nice to to get links to those if it's possible mr chair members of the subcommittee that is something that uh, was talked about at the very end because we did bring up that same point right when you're talking about 12 different reductions and whatever i mean the the packet we would overtake the packet right of the council packet and just for your for information it's going to the november 15th meeting uh but within that there will be links to the various studies so as um council people or the public want to see the actual study associated with that they could link they could click on the links individually um instead of just including them within the packet 
Okay. And if it's appropriate, can I just, because since we're all on, on this committee, you know, this committee, and I'm sure other people are interested in this, if you have those links or whatever, if you could email it to, to us whenever that's appropriate, I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other uh, discussions on the director's update? This may be the longest director's update I think we've had, and it's not even the real director. Congratulations, Eric. <laughs> you have won a prize. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I do believe our uh, vice chair is here now, and he has a report to the committee on where he's been and what the results were. Uh, my apologies for being late. Oh, thank you. My apologies for being late. Um, I was at the Diamondbacks game, and the Diamondbacks won. There you go. Hey, so that that I was a slight good luck charm, maybe. My apologies for being late. Um, it was a bit of a mess out there on the streets, but. Uh, Walking and biking, was, is, as always, is the best way to get around downtown. Thank you. Thank you very much. We were all win wondering what the update was. Okay, I think we're through with that item, unless I've missed somebody. We will move on to intersection and segment update. Reed Henry. Reed? Uh, thank you. Musso, can you hand me the... the uh... All right, let me see if I can uh, share the screen here. All right, we're up and running. Okay, yeah, thank you for uh, the opportunity to share with you uh, some more information on the intersection segment that we uh, identified at the last meeting. Um, I think there's uh, some traffic volumes, some speed volumes, uh, some crass information that was included in the agenda. So I just want to take this opportunity to kind of explain uh, that information. And if you have any questions, definitely ask. Let me see if I can get the next slide. Okay, here we go. Uh, Cape Creek Road and Union Hills Drive. Um, I kind of explain. Can you see the, some of the graphics? You got some uh, yellow stars there. That's reflecting where there's luminaires out there lighting the roadway. I do have some dimensions in there. If we have any questions about need to possibly widen the roadway or something like that, um, I'm also showing that you have uh, bus stops on all four legs of the intersection, except for the uh, the north uh, leg is does not have a pullout. Um, <laughs> The speed limits for both these roads is 45 miles per hour. And when we collected the 85th percentile speeds for those locations, uh, they were in a range of uh, 43 miles per hour for eastbound and westbound and 48 miles per hour for northbound and southbound. Uh, also, you can see on the, on the uh, aerial is the left turns have a positive offset. So basically, that's one of the safety measures that we use so that when you have uh, opposing left turns, they can see around one another because they're offset from the the line of sight, so that's one of the safety improvements we normally use. Um, we have protected, permitted uh, left turn phasing out there. Um, we also have uh, the, the, uh, the traffic signal mast arms and poles and some of the equipment out there is a little bit older than our current standards, and I think I'll have a, a slide to kind of show that as we, as we go on. Um, there is an ad lane for the northbound and the uh, eastbound approach. And then on the southbound departure lane, you can see some arrows where it shows a lane shift where you back, go back down to two lanes. Uh, this, on the southwest corner, you can see that the access points to the, uh, the business there are pretty close to the intersection. So when we do a lot of redevelopment, we try to move those, those driveways further away uh, so there's less uh, com conflicts at the intersection itself. Uh, when we did a pedestrian count that went from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., there were about 228 people that were crossing the, the intersection. And we also counted uh, 50 uh, bicyclists out in, in that area as well. Uh, with the traffic volumes, you can see there are about 22,000 uh, average daily traffic for northbound and southbound and about 2,100 for eastbound and westbound. So it's, it's not a major heavy road, but it's, it's got a lot of traffic out there. And then in the crash information, there's about 127 crashes at that location. That, that's over the five-year period, correct. Uh, so here is, is kind of a looking, uh, we're looking east. Uh, you can see you have three lanes of traffic. You have a bike lane out there. You got a right turn lane there. And you have really just one traffic signal head over the, over the lanes for the three lane approaches. And then you have the uh, what we call a doghouse, where you have the protective permitted lighting at the end of there. So that's really addresses the left turn movement. 
Uh, with our new uh, modernized signal design, we actually get ahead over each lane so that people know what, what the control is at the time. Um, quite often, you can see the uh, signal head on the pole itself. It's typically a, an eight inch uh, signal lens and those get upgraded to 12 as well. Also, you can see there's only one luminaire on this corner, which goes over that crosswalk that's crossing the street there. Typically with our new design, we end up having two luminaires to get, get light in on both crosswalks. Um, then I can go a little more on some of the signal modernization at a later date, but that's some of the differences you can see here from what we currently design. Uh, here is the uh, 27th Avenue Campbell to Camelback. Uh, again, this is a five lane arterial. It has a single sided lighting. So you can see the whole corridor on the image to the, in the middle. Uh, it's lighting on one side. Uh, there are bus stops you can see uh, at, at the location as well. They're a little bit further offset of the one on the south. Uh, we had uh, 155 crashes throughout this segment and that didn't really include all the crashes that occurred at the intersections of 27th and Camelback or Campbell and 27th Avenue. Uh, those were excluded from the, the crash analysis uh, when, we, when we selected a location on the hen. Uh, and again, these have older signal design too. So I'll get to another a real old signal design at, at, uh, at uh, uh, Campbell. Uh, here's kind of midway through that segment, uh, giving you an idea of what's at uh, Highland Avenue. Again, we have bus stops on, on both sides. Uh, we got a 40 mile per hour uh, speed limit out there. Again, there's kind of limited right of way. I think if, if you see, look towards the bottom, our right of way goes right to the back of sidewalk. So there's not a lot of ability to widen unless you uh, take property. Uh, the 85th percentile speeds uh, was uh, about 44 miles per hour, both northbound and southbound out there. And you can also see that there's a, basically a, a frontage road that pretty much is along that entire segment until you get to the the intersections where you have some commercial businesses and the in the lighting is all on the on the west side and you can see some of that on the uh in the median uh separating the front of the road and the main the main line uh this is getting down to kind of a look down all the way at the bottom at uh, campbell and 27th avenue again uh single-sided lighting bus stops and uh the older signal design standards which i think is the next slide so here, this is one of our really old type of signal designs out there. Uh, here we got three lanes and we got one signal head over the lanes. So, you know, if that kind of goes out, uh, that's correct. Yeah, and, and uh, so one of the things that we are trying to do with the road safety action plan is to modernize a lot of these signals uh, so that we do have a lot more control provided out there for, for people to uh, listen to. Uh, again, this one has just one ADA ramp on the corner, so normally, when we do a traffic signal uh, reconstruction, we get two ramps out there, get a little more directionality for people crossing the road. Uh, so really, you know, I, I think there was some data in, in the packets. Uh, hopefully we were able to take a look at that. If you have any questions about that, uh, please let me know. Um, so that's really, really what I wanted to present is some of the data that we shared with you. Okay, members of the committee, I did look through the data. It's quite overwhelming when you're looking at it uh, on paper. I will say that. It's hard to just kind of digest. It's a lot, a lot of data. Yes, sir. Yeah. Reed, thank you so much for the data and, and the overview. And in your, and it's a lot of data to go through. Um, in your expert opinion, let's start with 27th Avenue. Why is 27th Avenue in this section that we're talking about one of the most dangerous segments of streets when, in Phoenix. When, when I looked at, at the data, when we look at the nighttime crashes and the severity of those, I think that's what popped up on the high injury network is I think you had about six pedestrian fatalities out there and I think five were at night uh, in, in dark conditions. So like, like I indicated, we have lighting just on one side of the road. Um, I think the other serious injury crash that occurred out there, I think it was a head on. So you do have a lot of conflicting movements, you know, along a segment of road of people turning left and into, onto the road and off the, the main roads out there. So I think lighting is, is, is an issue. And Reed, follow up, what are we gonna do about that to make it safer? I know we're, we're vision zero, we're trying to, we are working to reduce street 
fatalities to zero. So what are we going to do about that segment? Well, I, I thought some of it would be, you know, giving the data to the committee as well, if they have any ideas of uh, what we would do. My, my approach would probably look at putting in lighting. Okay. Um, on both sides of the road. And what, what do you think, Reed, about, um, I know there's no bike lane on 27th Avenue. We have bike lanes on other streets, um, but not 27th Avenue. It seems like there's enough space there. I know I live nearby. Um, it seems like there, there's a lot of, just anecdotally, a lot of folks who either because they can't afford a car or, um, or otherwise do walk and bike in that area to get around. Is that an option to, to put a bike line at 27th Avenue? I don't have a, a definitive answer, but I think with our, you know, pavement preservation program that we do have, we look at locations where we can put in bike lanes out there. Um, I don't know the, the demand, you know, information on how many bikes would be out there, but um, that is definitely a, a treatment that we have, you know, applied throughout the city is providing more bike lanes. I think we had two bike crashes out there, if I remember, uh, from from the from the data. Um, but yeah, I, I'm willing to listen. Excuse me, two of the five. Uh, two, no, there was there, there was, was two, two crashes. bike crashes out of the hundred and. Oh, okay. You, you, you mentioned the fatality. Do you know read the fatalities? The if fatality, any. Fatality, I think, it was a pedestrian. Just a moment. And uh, I would say that based on the aerial, the, the space would have to come at the removal of the lane. I mean, I don't think it, there's, and I understand the current policy is to not do that. Is that a, I, I'm not, I'm unfamiliar with that policy. Is uh, that I, I believe there was a streets policy put forward that they would not remove lanes on arterial streets to add bicycles. I think that was what Kenny's position was. I, I'm looking at a blank stare from Indiana, so maybe I'm talking off the top of my head. Uh, so, Chair Callo and committee members, we, we actually have removed lanes to add in bike lanes on very specific corridors. Um, one that's uh, just recently, um, you know, that, that we did was 3rd Avenue, where we removed travel lanes. On arterials, that was what I was asking. Oh, on arterials. Um, I'm trying to think of one that we've done recently, and we haven't done any recently on, on arterials. And so, my, my information comes from the chair of the... Citizens Transportation Committee, so it's secondhand. So I, I can't, I'm just yeah. telling you, that's what he told me, so. The, and the difficulty on 27th Avenue, why, an additional reason why I bring it up is that, this, at least what you showed us, Reed, is that the sidewalks are right on the street and there's folks going on average, I think, as you said, 44 miles an hour, you with walk, people, pedestrians walking about this close to cars going 44 miles an hour. I will tell you from experience, it's extremely uncomfortable and very dangerous to do that. And that the data clearly shows that. So a bike lane to me, you know, it kills two birds with one stone. It provides a safe place for people to bike and also provides a buffer for people to walk safely as well, especially if that bike lane is protected. And I think following the data, if the, this is one of the most dangerous segments in, which is why we chose it. Yeah, this, this, um, is, this is a half mile segment and the majority of it does have a frontage road adjacent yeah. to it. So I don't know if cyclists would prefer to be even further away than traveling vehicles going 40 miles an hour with they would use that frontage road or not. Um, but that's you know, something that I think we would consider as well as is there a way to maybe provide a multi use path or something where you do have, you know, the frontage road that goes in the majority of that segment is something that could be considered. Yeah, because I think one of the. I think, and I missed, my apologies, I missed part of the earlier discussion, but I think one of the frustrations is we don't just want to look at the data and, and reflect on the, the data, which is really alarming. We want to be able to do something bold about it. Um, and I think this would be a segment where we can, we're looking at this one for a reason. Let's do something bold here. Um, and I think, a, you know, a bike lane should be, in, would make sense um, for a lot of reasons. In the uh, the the fatality was was a pedestrian during during the dark, yeah. dark conditions. Yeah, and was the pedestrian crossing the street or was the pedestrian walking on the sidewalk? Well, uh, no. on this one, the person was lying in the road. Lying in the road, <laughs> and uh, there is alcohol identified as one of the the uh, uh, circumstances involved. 
But was there any was there any sense that this person was uh, one of the homeless uh, members of the community, or because I, I I do know that that has been a problem in a number of cities. So I, I haven't done a thorough analysis okay. of all all the crashes. That sounds like it could be, but it, you know, don't want to assume anything. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, to say something if I could. Um, the, the pictures that are showing here and the, the fact that these are the high, in, high uh, injury network locations, it, it's also meaning they're going to be a very uh, high likely target for automated enforcement, red light cameras. And the engine, engineering deficiencies that the pictures are showing, and you, you discussed the, the lack of proper lighting, the, the, the old style signal with only one, one head up above where it should have one for every lane. All of those things need to be corrected. And there, we don't need a committee anywhere for our engineering department to take action and get those things corrected like now um, before we ever talk about putting more bicycle lanes in. And especially before we talk about putting a red light, light camera in at those locations. Um, I do have a question. Um, how fast were the night crashes going? Um, how how fast were the vehicles in the night crash collisions going? I believe. Let me see if in the speed data. I can tell you there was 40, 40 of the instances were uh, were speed related. So forty. I, I, I can't hear anything. Was the hear. lack of lighting in the PD report? Can you hear me? Uh, the the it's, there's you know it's looking at the specific crash to determine a lot of that. I think if, if you look at this, this, the speed report, you can see what the speeds are throughout the day. Um, right, average. At, at nighttime, do they have specific speeds that the vehicles were going during the night collisions? Uh, quite often on the reports, the officer may estimate what that person was going, but that's not a field that's commonly reported in the crash report. So there is no exact data about how fast the vehicles were going at night. I would agree with that statement. Thank you. Okay. Um, I did have a question. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of these are did not use crosswalks in the uh, collisions with the, uh, the vehicle collisions. Um, is there a way that we could even, because I'm seeing the 27th, I see there's a neighborhood in the photo that you show, there's people walking. Yeah. People are going across the street to get to these businesses. Is there a way we can do as Vision Zero, can we outreach to the communities to see what they want and we can work with the local communities in these intersections? We, we do have an educational component of the road safety action plan. And I think that's something we can look at is how can we get that message out to the people that, that need it as part of that plan? Um, would we be able to do like our committee an outreach to the community nearby, specifically like our committee? I suppose we could do whatever we feel is necessary. I, I don't know how we would, uh, what we would be, are we asking for their opinion or what are we doing? I, I would think it would be great to see what they're, why, what they're using to cross the street, how the, they want their street, because we are helping assist them with on better design on that crossroad, but the, the neighborhood might have a different idea that we could use to incorporate. Are you requesting to have some sort of community meeting or something? Who I don't know who the council member is that represents yeah. that area, but I, I would think appropriately, the council member might set up at a community meeting or something and invite the people there and members of this committee or whoever else is appropriate could could have that conversation. I think that's, is that what you're, I, just, I don't want to speak. Yeah, for no, you. no, no, that, that's exactly what I'm asking. I appreciate it, thank you. I have, uh, yeah, Jay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the data and all of the really, I know that a lot of work. Sent it just yeah, I actually j just uh, took a look at it now because right? it wasn't an action item, so I did delve into it. I yeah. We were just getting a report back. But, um, uh, but I, I, I just want to. What's going on? May I say something? Uh, this is Rosa Menjivar. Um Okay. Um, what, what, I represent that area. Uh, 27th Avenue because is a, a council woman um, guardado. So if uh, you have a uh, a presentation that you can give to the community around the area, I can contact the office and maybe we can do a community meeting or something. It's up to you if you 
would like to give more information uh, to the community, um, I can uh, contact the office. Thank you. Now, Jay, did you have some more? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Um, so um, it was interesting that you said that that a large percentage was was at night and lighting. And I think that we see in the in the overall data, just pretty much everywhere across the country, about seventy five percent of pedestrian fatalities occur after or in the in the dark. Um, so one of the things that I think is critical, not only at this location but wherever else in the city is appropriate, mm -hmm. is to improve um, the uh, the lighting for pedestrians. Uh, you know that's it's critical, especially you know I don't know by time school starts and at certain times of the year whether you know any any uh, kids are walking in the dark. Um, obviously, for safe routes to school, that's important. Uh, but additional lighting is really important. I, I was wondering if you also identified. You talked about like the driveways and, and that sort of thing. Are there any easy ways to reduce conflict points at that location? And, and when I say easy, I mean without like completely reconfiguring something or whatever. Is there is there any? I mean, maybe a, a restriction in and out of a driveway or something going, in, you know, turning in one direction as opposed to both, or j just to reduce those conflict points. Yeah, I, it's it's difficult to to restrict the movements. If you do it with a sign, people are going to do it anyways. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, even with some of our geometric improvements, people find a way to be able to still turn left when you have a right turn carrot in there. So they still sure. do it. So. And then also providing any fencing probably doesn't work because you have driveways everywhere. Um, so I think you know lighting is typically the most appropriate uh, to help drivers see those pedestrians that aren't really following the rules, but you know some of them could be in an unmarked crosswalk as well. Right. So you know I think lighting is the best way to and, improve, you know, the pedestrian safety. Right. And and as far as also as far as the signal heads and all of that sort of stuff is in is in the works for for that. For that sort of thing, so I mean, I, I think, and I don't want to make this as a blanket statement, but if you have a pedestrian at that kind of an intersection with a signal, for the most part, if the pedestrian is in a signalized crosswalk, crossing appropriately with the signal, there's probably a much less chance of, of something bad happening. So, uh, you know, it sounds sounds to me, and I don't want to assume because I haven't looked at everything, and you didn't say it exactly that that the pedestrian. Um, collisions and the fatality were things that were not within that realm of following, you know, as strictly as possible, you know, the, the protections that are already out there for pedestrians. Right. Right. I, Brianna, Brianna, was the intent, uh, today we're looking at these things, but do I recall the intent is that in the future we would have like a um, toolbox of items that we might recommend for each of these two things to, to for you to consider as improvements, and today we're just kind of getting the information for the next step. Is that what I remember? Yeah, Chair Callow, yes. So at the last meeting, if you recall, we, we shared with you three intersections as well as three corridors. You selected the intersection and the corridor. Uh, today, Reed was bringing back data because I think you guys wanted data. Um, if there's any additional data that you didn't see here that you think that we might be able to secure, we're happy to bring back additional data. And then I think the thought is through this committee, you guys were going to have a lot of healthy discussion on opportunities or things, like you said, in the toolbox that you wanted us to consider in terms of improvements in here to improve safety within this intersection and the quarter. So that would be urgent that we would get like, okay, here are the staff kinds of things that you would consider and which one of those or are there other things that we think on top of those that we might recommend back to you? Is that kind of how you see this going forward? So Chair Callow, we could definitely come back and provide you some of the um, uh, safety countermeasures or things that we do from an engineering perspective when we're looking at a corridor or an intersection. But then we're also happy to entertain any additional ideas that this committee may have that maybe we may, might need to go back and do some additional research. Maybe you've been to another city where you've seen something implemented that you'd like us to take a look at. Um, and we can do some additional research and have further discussion. Okay. And, uh, yes, sir. Oh, and, and a quick question. We picked these because they're, they're the most dangerous areas. Um, just my perspective is adding some lights is, is not sufficient to address the most dangerous areas of, of our city. We're starting with these because they're extremely dangerous and we've seen a lot of fatalities and serious injuries. Um, I don't think 
you know, to the point of, I heard maybe we can't, you know, do certain things. I don't, yeah, I, I don't think we should take anything off the table when we're, when we're talking about the most dangerous areas of our city. Um, we should look at everything, uh, including, it's a huge issue. I've, I've walked on 27th Avenue. It's near my house. Um, and it is extremely unsafe because of the proximity of, of the sidewalk to the very fast cars. Uh, and we need to look at how to address that as well. Um, there aren't any easy answers. I know there are, you know, we shouldn't take reducing a, a car travel lane uh, off the table uh, to address the lives that are lost there. I think that we've got to keep all of that on the table to create a buffer for pedestrians and not blame any pedestrians or anyone who's getting hurt out there and get bold action that meets the challenge of how many lives are being lost out there on the streets. Quick, quick question, if not comment. Who's, um, who is that? This is Dan Penton. So I'm looking at the aerials and I'm noticing that um, in the corridor, there's, there's no, you know, possibly a reason for a lot of the mid block crossings or the, you know, not in the crosswalk injuries from happening, not in the crosswalk is because there's no crossings there's at all between in the corridor. I'd say for, you know, at least this half mile between Cam, uh, Campbell and like Camelback, um, there's no, there's a lot of, in, there's a lot of, a lot of curb ramps, a lot of like uh, areas where, you know, people might be prompted or just naturally think it's you know a place to cross that I think you know there's, there's an area there's an opportunity there to maybe provide either by signage or you know you know off, put painting crosswalks doing something that you know in, in addition to lighting that might make might make the streets a little bit safer just you know just in general um, because when you you've got your curb ramps and then you've got a hundred feet of right away. You know, somebody crossing, you know, trying to cross that at night is going to be, a, you know, a sitting duck. So I'm just thinking that, you know, at least if there was some type of, you know, you know, markings with the, in addition to the lighting, that might, it might, might improve somewhat a little bit. You know, it's something we'd have to discuss, but it's just, that's just some, um, some observation, you know, some insight I had or thoughts I had on it. But I'm, I'm in agreement with it, with with everybody's uh, comments. I think that uh, this is definitely a, an issue. I don't think anything should be taken off the table, and all the options should be explored. Uh, I, I think the uh, gentleman next. No, no, no. I don't want to step on anybody. So. No, I'm just yeah. let him go. He's okay. he didn't look this way first. My fault. You're you're welcome to go first. I, I'll like. start down here next. You'll yeah. be. We'll go there and then we'll go here. Okay. So. Uh, so I, I agree with what Dan was saying. Um, if the data shows that, you know, some of these pedestrian collisions were people that were trying to cross mid-block, but there's long distances between areas where where they have a safe place to cross, certainly the city would want to want to take a look at that. I know, you know, everything's expensive and everything costs money, but um, uh, you know, to to the other point, which is with the edge point, which is you know you don't want to necessarily blame anybody. Sometimes these are forced errors, but you know, somebody drunk lying in the street. I mean, I don't want to blame them, but I mean, what what is what what are you supposed to do? Better lighting, you know? I mean, that that's a societal problem, which is a little bit beyond, I think, the scope of of uh, this committee. But um, but anything that we can do to make sure that there are no forced errors um, that we, within reason, I think, you know, should should definitely be looked at. And um, uh, I do want to make a point about the you know the car lane and that sort of thing. I mean, we have to be really careful. Uh, number one about you know, kind of rushing to reducing a car lane just for the sake of reducing a car lane. If the data shows that, you know, it's appropriate that the traffic volume, you know, isn't going to be affected if it's not going to push the traffic onto the frontage road, which may be more dangerous. I mean, cars are going to seek their own level, as I say, like water does. And so we just have to be careful about, um, you know, saying, not saying that we should take anything off the table, but I am saying that we have to be really careful about some of these treatments, which are can cause other problems and and um and in their own right so if we can fix the problem without doing that and causing the other problems um, we should at least try those and it sounds like there's a number of things that streets is planning um short of that and we should definitely see if we do that and 
uh, and have improvements. I have a just sort of a more general question, which is, um, I, I know the Road Safety Act Action Plan was approved not that long ago, but um, I'm sure some of these improvements predate that of where you've done these things in the, in the city. Have you, have you made some of these improvements at locations that you've identified in the past and seen uh, an improvement from this sort of stuff or is the data not there yet? Uh, we do have some of that data as, as one of the five E's that we have in a real safety action plan. It is evaluation. So I am currently looking at, at specific types of treatments that we have implemented and then doing some before and after studies to determine if they've been effective or not. So that is something that will be forthcoming, but I don't think we've done one specifically for some of these treatments that we're talking about today. Right. If there's any one that's appropriate for maybe another presentation sometime in the future, I'm sure the group would love to see you know, what was done and then what the result was. All right, I have a yep, go ahead. comment. Um, I think that being able to reduce the streets, a lane would should still be on the table and considered because mainly because of induced demand. If you decrease the vehicle lanes and increase the bike structure and actually make it to where people want to ride their bikes, people will ride their bikes. If you make the sidewalk safer and not have them attached to a street where everyone's going 40, I don't like walking down the streets. Sometimes I have to because I cannot afford a vehicle, but I have to go down those lanes and I shouldn't have to fear for my life if I have to go to work and I have to walk down those sidewalks. I think focusing on lighting is not the biggest thing that we should be focusing on right now because vehicles do have lights. They have headlights. If you're going a ridiculous speed and super quick, you won't be able to see the pedestrian in front of you. So that's why we need to see the data of how, what the speed they were going at night. That's why that's important because vehicles do have headlights and you could see pedestrians in your headlights if you're not going way past the speed limit. If you're, and decreasing the roads would decrease the design speed so vehicles would automatically go slower and you would be able to see the pedestrian in your headlights. Thank you. Yeah, just kind of hop off that. Um, I also agreed that there should be um, like bike lanes, even if it means. Oh, yeah, I got the green light. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I also agree that there should be um, more bike lanes, even if it means, you know, the reduction of lanes, uh, simply because I know what it's like to walk down the, the sidewalk as well, getting that close to cars going like 40, 50 sometimes you get 60. It's very scary. And to think um, there's no bike lane as well. Now the bike, now the bicyclist and the, you know, people on the sidewalk, the pedestrians now have to share that bike lane, which means they're going to have to, you know, be even closer to the, to the cars that are passing. So providing that buffer is really necessary just for the safety of both cars and pedestrians, but mainly pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, having that bicycle, bicycle lane can also encourage biking, allow biking um, to reduce the number of cars on the road. Um, I'm seeing a lot of like logistics and like um, it's really eye-opening. I also want to hear from the community to see what they want. May they know something or have ideas that we may not have or may they want something that we're not providing. So I would like to hear from the community as well. So. Just commit. Um, Chair Carlo, so uh, Reed, in terms of next steps, there's a lot of energy to, of wanting to see a change on on these areas. What's our next step to to making these two areas that we're talking about safer? Is it is it bringing more in more community input back to this committee? Is it you know what is it? Because I know these area, this intersection, and this segment was selected because there are no plans right now. We avoided those areas, but there already were plans that are really unsafe, but there are plans. These areas, there are no plans. So what, what's the next step to, to making this intersection and this segment safer? Um, from, from what I'm hearing, I think the committee wants some more data to do the analysis. I think I hear the committee wants to have some public engagement regarding the area. Um, I guess, it, you know, we just have to establish a project to fund the additional 
uh, analysis and community engagement that, that we're looking for. So I guess at the community engagement, we'd be providing uh, potential uh, solutions out there and getting some type of uh, input on that. Um, Reed, I, I, let me, let me, I, I think that's what I was alluding to earlier when I was talking to Brianna is, okay, we've got all this today. Um, is, is this something that what, maybe instead of a formal meeting, we do a, a workshop meeting on these two items where staff and, and the committee look at, okay, what is, what, what, are, what, are, what can we do here? Can we, you know, what happens if we do take a lane off? What happens if we add lights? What are the impacts given what you all would typically recommend to happen? Um, and I, I guess that's the kind of struggling with, okay, we know this now, what do we do? You know, do we give you recommendations today? Do we, where, where do we go from here? I think is the basis that we may all be grasp, grappling with here. So, so Chair Callow and, and members of the committee, um, I, I think when we kind of um, came up with this idea of, you know, kind of workshopping with this committee in terms of what ideas you have, what you, what ideas you guys have, and maybe sharing with you guys what ideas we may have in terms of some of the um, engineering solutions we typically implement. Um, I think we can, I think it's a great idea if maybe we, we dedicate a future meeting to kind of workshopping this and kind of talking through what are some of the opportunities that we see here um, and potentially put together some information. Obviously with everything that we do in the street transportation department, it does require public input. So if we are doing a planning process, if we now have a project and we're moving into design, all of that involves um, public engagement and, and working with the um, both the um, directly impacted community as well as the larger uh, city of Phoenix community. So um, anything that would come out of this committee in terms of a recommendation of potential project, and we know that we do have um, funding as part of the road safety action plan. So we have annually $10 million. Um, I will tell you, uh, Reed and team have been um, already working to identify projects already. So when we talk about some of some things like traffic signal rebuilds or lighting or things like that, we've already identified some projects that we're working on. But obviously, when we think about um, a project like this, these aren't projects that happen overnight, right? And so um, we are talking years down the line, particularly if there isn't um, enough right away and we are now going in through the acquisition process. That usually typically takes about 12 to 18 months in itself. Um, and so I think at this point, it's really trying to nail down with this committee in terms of the data that we're provided. And if you guys want additional data, what do you think is going to make this road safer? ultimately can be packaged as a um, either a pre-designed project that we could then bring out to the committee to solicit feedback on some of the items that you guys have scoped out for, for this corridor and intersection. Yeah, I've got a question down here. Tricia, that's the second time I heard you say, what other data do you want? I don't know what other data I want. What data are we not getting that we should ask for? So I mean, we, I, I, I would, I, I don't think it's maybe it's almost a rhetorical question, but you know, I, I would say we want as much as you can give us, right? I mean, anything that we need, especially, you know, I'm not Tom, you know, I mean, this is, this is a, a lot of this is an eye opener for me. So, you know, the more data, the better. Yeah. So I would say in terms of the street transportation department, we have provided uh, all the data that we typically have at our hands. Um, I think a, a, a data source that might be available, and I, I know we have um, uh, Lieutenant Junkie, PD may have a different perspective, right? They, they are out there. We have community action officers that are out there. Um, we potentially could get with them to kind of understand better, um, you know, some of the demographics and things that they're seeing out there that, you know, we, we as the street transportation department aren't privy to. So I, I think there may be some additional data that we don't typically focus on. Um, or you guys may have ideas of like, hey, what about this that maybe we are not always thinking about? So I think today we provided the data that we typically look at in terms of traffic counts, volumes, um, and things like that. But if you guys have any ideas and you say to us, hey, can you go try to find this data? We absolutely will make every effort to see if that, that data is available. Well, I, can I just yep, go ahead? I can tell you, I mean, if pedestrian accidents are happening um, if they're not happening at the intersection, they're happening somewhere in between or near that intersection. I mean, that to me is compelling. You know, how often does that happen? What do we have to do mid-block 
to so I, I don't know to what degree at what point is, is is an incident considered at the intersection and somewhere else other than that intersection i mean you know i'm not saying this is the way you operate but when, you know when i hear you know the news at night they, they talk about a fire at 24th and thomas it's two blocks away so you know i, I think in this particular case i think we really need specifics and 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 if that's what we're getting, that's great. But the, but the mid block incidents to me are really uh, tell a story. Like something's happening in that neighborhood that's causing people to choose that route to cross the street. And so, you know, why? So that would be one thing that I guess I would look for. Everything I saw tonight was talking about a specific <laughs> intersection, but there's yeah. things going on around that, you know. Rosa? Yeah, I would like to um, say that the best data also that you can get beside the one that uh, Ms. Tricia already have uh, is uh, with the police department. Um, as a blog watch and a Mary Bell, uh, what I did was I requested from Phoenix Police Department and from um, uh, City of Phoenix, uh, also uh, the universities, U uh, of A, and um, ASU help us with the data. And we put a PowerPoint um, about 75th Avenue and it's great data because it's from uh, really professional people and from different point of view. So it's more than two, it's, 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 it's good data. So we can uh, request to Phoenix Police Department. Good. The, Trish, and just to your to your question, I mean, just speaking for myself, um, mm -hmm. I, I've got enough data um, to know that they're. What's that, Brianna? Brianna? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brianna. Yes, that's right. My my apologies, Trisha. Good to see you, Brianna. To your point, uh, my apologies. Um, the I've got enough data, and that's why we selected these areas because these are mm -hmm. there's a lot of deaths um, and serious injuries happening. So I have enough data on that. I guess the only thing I'm looking, I think I'm, I'm personally ready to move on to the next step of action. Um, mm -hmm. So the only information I guess I would want next would be from folks from the local communities there on their thoughts specifically. Um, I've walked at least on the 27th Avenue portion, not the one far north, but the 27th Avenue. And um, so looking at the data and I walked it, it's very dangerous feeling um, as a, somebody who's, who's walking in and around that area. So I, I'm ready. I think you've provided great um, data and information. Reed, thank you so much. Um, I'm ready to move forward with an action. Um, so I'd be looking to do that. I, I have a question for you, okay. Reed. How many accidents involved pedestrians on, on the sidewalk, not crossing the street? Uh, I'd have to look at the crash reports. I didn't have that in my summary. That would be that would be interesting for me to know because I, I, do, I do understand that walking next to 45 miles an hour cars is not comfortable, but I, but I wonder is it actually are people getting hurt or is it just a comfort feeling that, that is bothering people? Right. Based on based on the citywide data that I have looked at, the majority of them are occurring in the, on the street itself. But I have seen some locations like one that's happened near uh, Paradise Valley Mall last week is, you know, someone was on the sidewalk. You know, I think three people were hit due to a crash that occurred in the intersection. Yeah, most of them are spill-offs from a crash that, yeah, that could be. Yeah, could it's, be not, it's not somebody's running off the road. And, yeah. So, I, I mean, to get to your point, you, you, you've said, Ed, a number of times that it's very dangerous to walk on the sidewalk. I believe it's a very dangerous and uncomfortable feeling, perhaps, but I don't believe people are getting hurt. Uh, so I, I, I recognize you would like it to be more comfortable and people would feel more comfortable walking there, but I'm just saying... I don't think we're hurting people today. With, well, with all due people, respect, there are a lot of people getting hurt and killed there. And that's what the data, that's why we picked these. No, no, no. I mean, what, that's what I'm asking. How many people are getting hurt and killed walking on the sidewalk? That, that's the question. And no. I don't think we have that. We don't have a specific number. They're usually walking across the street. M Mr. Chairman, we may never get the answer to that question because the reason why they're, they're not walking on the sidewalk and they're crossing cross block is because they don't want to walk on the no, sidewalk. No, no, I understand, but I'm just saying well, if, if, the, if the... Yeah, no, I, I know what you're saying, but... aren't getting hurt on the sidewalk, we shouldn't say the sidewalk is dangerous and it's killing people because it's not. Yeah, I, I think the question of people crossing the block is 
a distance to a place that feels safe across the street, I think. And I don't, I mean, I, I, I see if, ask if streets would, would agree with that. If you do, if you do see people walking, crossing, not near, uh, not in a signalized or a, or, or a protected crosswalk, um, it's because to some extent, maybe it's a long distance to, to get to one. And so it's just, you know, the risk reward all of a sudden becomes, I'm going to try to make it across. Obviously, when you have people making bad decisions in terms of, um, you know, uh, being being drunk and walking out on the street and walking into the street, it, it's really hard to control that. But, and, you know, you can do all the engineering in the world, uh, uh, but, you know, that's, that's really hard to control. And I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm just saying that we can only do what we can do. And, um, and if we have people who are crossing the block a lot in that area, then, you know, maybe there's some treatments that can be made, whether it's a hawk or whether it's a rectangular rapid flashing beacon or something that's, that gives people the opportunity to have a protected way to cross the street that doesn't require them to walk hugely long distances with which people are not inclined, especially in the heat and, you know, that sort of thing. So, Mr. Chair. Well, who's Mr. Chair? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, if I may, so sitting here just listening, um, I think I may have a couple suggestions uh, to get us to move to the next agenda item. We have a whole nother presentation for you guys. Um, one thing is, is, as I go back and I read through the code, I think this we need to be careful with this committee about um, how far right this committee reaches out. I mean, the, the, in reading through it, right, there's a pretty limited authority and autonomy that this group has without city council approval. So to the question about going to the public. Uh, and I think that's a great idea. I think that should be coordinated through the council offices themselves, right? Because then it isn't this committee doing that or leading it. You can attend. Now you may, you may want to have some question about quorum and, you know, you start running into those kind of issues, right? If too many of you show up and those types of things, right? But so I think maybe that sounds like next steps, right? Is to have someone on this committee reach out to the council office, if that's what this committee would like to have happen, right? To reach out and, and do those types of things. Secondly, um, here's the benefit of me not being the street transportation director quite yet is uh, as a city engineer, I actually know of a project and I've been working with the CED Community and Economic Development Office. Uh, and that office is interested in um, improving this area now that may not include bike lanes or dropping a lane or whatever right but uh, the CED office is looking at doing some improvements to 27th Avenue from Indian School all the way up to Northern uh, a lot of it is going to be targeted at the intersections there'll be some uh, improvements to ADA crosswalks there'll be some improvements with landscaping right so it's kind of trying to change the character of the corridor which in theory then would have some impact on design on speeds and those types of things right so may it may address some of the instances of homelessness or um, intoxicated accidents and those types of things so i do know that's kind of a side note just for this group it isn't it isn't all on read or the street transportation department right it's a citywide problem right so ced is looking at in this this uh corridor in particular so with that, if there isn't any others, I would kind of recommend that. I mean, it sounds like maybe next steps is working with the council office to get some more information that can then be coordinated with the street transportation department. But uh, if we could to kind of keep moving this along, uh, I would respectfully request that we move on to the next agenda item. I hear you. Uh, if, if no one has anything new to add, we do have two members of the committee that have signed, of the community that have signed up to speak on this, and I'd like to give them their opportunity. Uh, sh should they be coming to a microphone? Well, how do you want to handle it? Okay, there's one down here on the end. And first, we would have Stacy Champion. And do we have a time limit on this, Brianna? Is this a three minute presentation? Or two? Okay, two. Go ahead. Oh, there's the microphone. I forgot about that one. Hello. Oh, that's loud. Members of the Vision Zero Committee. Um, with regard to this, this is a rocket science. I mean, you, you could Google and find a myriad of, you know, uh, pedestrian buffers, um, mid-block crossing, um, 
temporary low cost structures to slow traffic down. Um, protected bike lanes, planting trees slows people down. None of this is new. Um, and I would just say, too, that we should maybe think about people studies versus uh, traffic studies. Has the staff gone and just watched people? How do people move? Where are they going? Why are they going there? Um, obviously, when it's you know, 120 degrees, nobody wants to walk an extra mile out of their way. And as somebody who uh, travels quite a lot, I can tell you that there are cities in this country and around the world who are doing a hell of a good job uh, at, at making sure that streets are safe and accessible to all people, not just cars. Um, I, I think uh, this 27th and, and, and another ask um, I asked for um, the information that was going to get presented to you and got it maybe 20 minutes before this meeting. I think that if you want to have good um, interaction with the members of the public, uh, that that information should be put on the website before the meeting so everybody has a chance to review it um, in the 20 minutes that I had to look at the data really quickly. Um, it looked like the Camelback and um, 27th Ave, you had maybe about six pedestrian fatalities and a couple of bike fatalities. And that uh, Cave Creek one, I only saw like two bike. Yes, I will wrap it up in one second. Two bike fatalities. And those were bicyclists who I think ran lights. So I would also just ask this committee to focus on places like 27th Avenue, where we do know that a large number of people are being killed while walking and biking. Thank you. Oh, and then I would also just quickly add that anybody working on these issues should personally, especially engineers, et cetera, should be out there personally walking and biking um, these areas before yep. they're making you're, these you're decisions. You're well over your two minutes now. So. Oh, I'm done. Thanks so much. You said that once before. <laughs> Nicole Rodriguez. Yes, Nicole Rodriguez. Thank you, committee, and thank you, staff. Um, I'll be brief, and I'll just piggyback a little bit off what Stacy was talking about with the data. The data, I was wondering if in the future, too, with sharing that, if you could include it in a spreadsheet format. Um, it's really hard to digest that information. We're talking about uh, nighttime collisions, but really when you look at it uh, quickly, it looks like it's pretty equal to day night. So uh, we want to be able to play with the data. If it's going to be available, if it could be like in an Excel spreadsheet format, um, I think the committee, um, they're pretty savvy too, where it's something that I think would tell more of a story for us rather than relying on your time and effort to always get all these answers, right? So if that could be shared at least with the committee and hopefully on the website in the future too. Um, along with that too, with the Union Hills, um, with the Union Hills and Cape Creek, um, every life is vital. But I'm really curious why that was chosen. There's the thing I, I keep hearing about districts. I mean, this comes up with trees too, right? Where do we plant trees? We have to spread it out evenly. But no, that's not really how it should be done. It should be where the need is the greatest. Um, I want to make sure that we're focusing, still focusing on where the need is the greatest um, with that. Um, and yes, it is true, induced demand actually does make it safer when we reduce the amount of lanes. It actually reduces speed. And um, it's even been said by the director or former director to a planning commission member when she wanted to widen a roadway, I believe it was um, baseline. Um, brought, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the road in South Phoenix. He said, no, because if we widen it, that will only increase speed. So let's make that consistent throughout. If we have very wide roads, let's use that same logic there and think about how that could happen. And I think bike lanes are relevant everywhere. And the safer they are, the more we're gonna use them. So. Thank you. Okay, now we would like to move on to, since this is not an action item, uh, street planning and design guidelines manual update. And I believe this is where uh, you could have the most impact on future things. I don't know that we could have it right now, but this is the, the heart of what goes into building a street is, is the way I understand it. And the presentation will be Chris Cole. <laughs>
Good afternoon, uh, sub- subcommittee members. Uh, my name is Chris. Turn your mic on. It is on. Can you not hear me? I hear you now. There we go. Is that better? That's better. better. Good afternoon, subcommittee members. It's nice to be here with you today. Uh, as uh, as uh, the chairman brought out, uh, we're here to provide an informational update on the design guidelines that were recently adopted by council. So, let's see if I can get this working. So again, my name is Chris Kowalski, Deputy Director here in the Street Transportation Department. One of my areas of purview or oversight is our Development Coordination Group, uh, which basically looks at all private developments coming into the City of Phoenix, pre-applications, preliminary reviews, uh, zoning cases, et cetera. And we provide stipulations uh, to those, to those developments uh, in terms of right-of-way improvements, mitigation, right-of-way dedications, things of that nature. So um, one of the reasons why this design guideline kind of fell under our group was because one of the main users is the development community. And so it kind of got housed within our development coordination group. So in 2009, the street planning and design guideline, oh, it's on mine. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh. All right. So, so just so you can kind of see here, 2009 was the last update to the design guidelines. Uh, on the right here is the 2023 update. You can see quite a bit of difference, advancement here, and what we're trying to achieve with this, this manual. So why update the manual? Well, what seems old. Uh, 2009 was a long time ago. Are you not able to see it? I can see it. I see it fine. <clears throat> All right. That's good, that's good. So why, right, update the manual? Well, like I was stating, the old one was old. Uh, it was pretty outdated. We know that since 2009, there's been a lot of adopted policies and procedures by our council. Um, one of those being the tree and shape master plan, the green infrastructure handbook. Um, so a lot of things the city has progressed since 2009, and we wanna make sure that we capture those. Other areas were references to appropriate guidelines. We know. MUTCD and AASHTO guidelines, as well as uh, bridge construction specifications, roadway construction, those things have been updated since 2009. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a manual that aligned with those uh, existing national standards and codes. And I think one of the biggest things probably one I, what is most impactful and probably for this group, especially in this committee, is the incorporation of visual uh, graphics into it. You know, the last manual is very text heavy. And so it was very hard for people to then be able to read that, understand what the intent was. And so when you look at this, what we try to do is really look at providing more of a visual context, ease of use in the manual, and so that people understood what the intent, what we're trying to achieve. And I think that's very important, especially when you look at site visibility, um, stopping site distances, things of that nature that this committee uh, is very focused on. And so now you can basically show that to our design committee, uh, show that to existing employees and so forth and what the intent of what we're trying to achieve through these codes. So I think that's kind of an important part that I probably want to just highlight here for this group. So again, the purpose really was to integrate current adopted codes, plans, policies, to make sure it was up to date with our current council on their directives, uh, provide reference to other accepted local and national standards and guidelines, making sure that we were referencing those appropriately. In a lot of cases, we were able to kind of minimize this design guidelines because we're able to think ahead and refer to other national adopted standards uh, that 
most cities utilize throughout the country. So again, who's this manual for? It's really for two people, uh, two groups. It's for streets, employees, uh, but it's also for the planning and development department. Uh, so internal staff, but then also our consultants, uh, the ones who are out there designing the paving plans, the roadway plans and so forth, making sure that they have the ability to go to the manual um, very quickly, efficiently. Uh, this saves them time, it saves them effort from actually having to contact the city for guidance or, or worst case, guessing, right? Uh, on what the city's wants or needs are, or what they should be looking to design to their plans. So this is primarily for them. And that's why, again, uh, it's very important that we put this in a place or put this in a context that was very easy to read. It's something like a manual. Our intent was to have a manual that people wanted to use. So the approval process, uh, we started with the creation of the manual update from 2009. Uh, we went through internal stakeholder review within the city. So that included the planning and development department. Uh, traffic operations, we worked with transit, uh, other users of the roadway. We then took that to the development advisory board. Maybe some of you are familiar with that through the planning development department. Um, they have a technical subcommittee uh, that we worked with for a few months that went page by page through the manual itself, looking at the technical specifications of that. Uh, and that got approval in December of 2022. It then was taken to formal DAB. Which DAB is made up of very similar to this committee, a cross section of, of uh, individuals, architects, engineers, developers, community members um, to look at that, review it, and it was formally accepted by them and with recommendation to the Transportation Infrastructure Subcommittee, which was then unanimously approved in April 2023. And then again, it brings us to this current summer, the formal council, uh, council adoption in June 28th uh, of this year. So kind of a quick summary of where we see but wanted to save some time. I, I know we're kind of getting short on time, but I want to save some time for questions uh, for the committee itself. Be happy to entertain those. Yeah, I have a question. The, uh, the report, the street planning and design uh, guidelines is excellent. I mean, I've had a chance to go through it. It's very comprehensive, very detailed, very easy to understand. Um, and that's good. But at the beginning, it says that the uh, the purpose is for the efficiency and safety for all users, including vehicles. So I think it's great that, that it's going to incorporate engineering that's doing what it can to keep vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists from touching each other. We need to do everything we can to protect, uh, protect everybody out there. We cannot do that at the expense of the motorist. I know that may not be very popular and, and not heard very well here, but we are not a 15 minute city and we're not gonna be that anytime soon. Um, I guess I would have a question. Is there any specific guideline in here as to when a road diet should be used? Uh, Commissioner Farley, we do not have guidance on a road diet or road uh, reduction as is pointed out in previous conversations, those would go through independent studies and analysis if submitted by uh, council or, or so forth. Then we, typically we don't have structured guidelines for reduction of, of, a, of a lane. Like I said, those are specific study requests that would be done through right. an independent analysis. And, and that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything on that. And I know there's guidelines for the traffic impact analysis that I'm sure would be around the uh, question of whether a road diet should go in or not. And we would just have to make sure before that happens that it's an analysis that involves the whole area around where the road diet is suggested for uh, to look at the impact overall. And, and I think it's just, it's wrong to, to think that we're going to do some things that are gonna convince people to get out of their cars and start commuting to work on their bicycle or going to the grocery store on their bicycle or walking. Um, for the 99% of the people who live in Phoenix, that is just not an option. And to try to uh, restrict their free movement would be unconscionable. I'm done. I got a question. Um, Oops, I, 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 that you did. Dan. Yeah, no, yeah. I appreciate James's uh, comments on the road dice and for bringing that up. Um, uh, my question is, is that 
currently, I don't think there's any process in place to put uh, any type of traffic calming measures on an arterial street. Um, and I wanted to know if that's something that uh, engineering has looked at, um, you know, you know, narrowing the roadway specifically around like, school zones. Um, because what I'm seeing a lot of is, you know, a lot of these bikeways, especially, you know, bike lanes, especially in schools, they're just used for parking in the afternoons. So, you know, is there, a, you know, you know, for staging for pickups and drop off? My, that's my concern. Is there is there a way that the city is looking at to to address that kind of issue? Because um, it play it's it's a significant safety you know issue in you know twice a day, five days a week at least. And there's you know countless schools in the in the city, so um, that is just that's one of my questions. But in addition to you know bike lanes and that that's not the only way to to reduce vehicles on the street. And you, we need to inc increase our transportation network, our public transportation out here in Levine. I think we you know eight percent of our households that don't have access to a car. Um, how are they going to get to where they need? When we have, we are one of the most underserved communities in the city for public transportation. So yeah, bikes are great. I'm a biker. I love you know being out there on the bicycle, but we also need to look at increasing our public transportation to make uh, to make that more accessible uh, for people who may not want to ride a bike or who can't ride a bike. Dan, so, Dan I don't want to cut you off, but could we stick to the item on the agenda we're talking about, which is the design guidelines, not the city trans transit system? Yeah, I, and thank you, I appreciate that. But um, yeah, we're off, we're off a little bit there. But uh, no, that my big my question was about the, the, um, okay. traffic navigation or traffic calming on on arterial roadways. If that's something that's in the plans or something that's being looked I, at, I is that anything that's covered in this manual, or is that something outside the scope of this manual, Chris? I'll I'll defer to Carl Langford. Okay. Um. Members of the committee and chair, uh, so it's not actually so there is some traffic calming discussed in the manual, but more specifically, the traffic calming is on collector streets and local streets and more oriented to new developments as the development comes in and builds a subdivision section. How do you meet uh, traffic calming needs or, or different subdivision codes, whatnot? Uh, as far as traffic calming on arterial streets, um, national standards and whatnot, the, the higher speed, higher volume roads, traffic calming does not work very well. We have somewhat attempted way in the past, um, and they were removed fairly quickly um, <laughs> when that was done. And so, unfortunately, there's not a good, no one knows a good way of traffic calming a high speed arterial type roadway at this point. I think your statement that high speed and calming are, uh, you know, they, they're against each other. Well, right. I mean, planting trees and, you know, making the roadway seem narrower, you know, naturally makes people drive slower. So that's just, you know, off the top of my head. Okay. But, you know, <laughs> Any other? Issues. Yeah, Ed? Yeah, thank you, Chair Carlo and Chris. Uh, I, my question is about on, if you turn on the traffic, uh, on, on the guidelines on page 27 related to bicycle facilities, 2.4.1, um, uh, my question is, it's kind of similar to what Dan was asking um, and similar to what uh, previous, I think James was asking about keeping uh, cars and, and, and cyclists and pedestrians away from each other is about the temporary bike lanes. Um, there is, I'm looking at page 27 of the, of the report on uh, chapter two. My understanding, just I watched the um, June meeting of the council and, and that the reason that this came to this committee is that the council does want feedback on these guidelines uh, in light of them passing vision zero to try to make our streets safer. So my comment is about the portion related to uh, temporary bike lanes, which become parking lanes during certain times of the day. And I'll just read it just so we're on the same page because I know you're thumbing yeah, through it, Chris. Because I'm 27 for, in mine. I'm sorry, printed copy was is transit. So that's why I was just. It's it's on page 27, but also for reasons I don't understand at the bottom, it says page 363. Um, and I'll just read the portion since we're on the same page, literally. It says, quote, to recognize the needs of residents along commuter routes on collector slash local streets, the bike lane may, may be signal, may be signed as in effect for only parts of the day and imposing parking restrictions only during commuting periods, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, in effect, the, the 
guidelines are saying that bike lanes can be just temporary bike lanes and be parking lanes on certain portions of the day. Uh, and the feedback I want to provide is that doesn't work. Um, in my neighborhood, I've got little kids, they want a bike and we have these type of temporary bike lanes, cars park in them off these hours. And frankly, my kids want to bike in these lanes in the, in the bike lane outside of these hours as well. Um, it, what it really means a temporary bike lane, it, it means it's not a bike lane at all. Cars are going to park there. It's going to put cyclists, my kids, our families and our neighborhoods into conflict with cars. What I'm specifically thinking about in my neighborhood is along Campbell between 15th Avenue and 19th Avenue, as well as along third Avenue, we have these temporary bike lanes. It doesn't work. Uh, I can't think of an instance where temporary bike lanes, where it's supposed to be a parking lane and then people are supposed to move their car. There's zero enforcement of, of cars being parked in the bike lanes. In my experience as a neighborhood association president, no one's enforcing those things. What I, what I recommend, what I request is that this language be stricken and that the guidelines be changed to phase out these temporary unsafe, you know, uh, I guess parking slash bike lanes to make them just bike lanes all day long so our families can use those. So, okay. um, I, I, I think the manual that you're referring to isn't necessarily the new manual. If we can talk afterwards, I, I can explain some of the stuff and make sure that you get across what you're doing. Currently, we are generally looking at these type of locations to try to figure out how we can remove those time of day restrictions. Oftentimes it needs public involvement and requirement and whatnot. And so it is a more complex problem um, per se, but that is something, but I don't think it's in this manual. At least I'm, I'm looking at what you guys sent me as I was, I'm also looking at what, um, what you guys sent to city council back in June. And that's what I read just now into the record. It's if you're looking at the PDF that I opened up, that was sent to me, it's on page 36 of the PDF. Um, it's the, it's the time of day. What I, I'm just going to call them time of day bike lanes. So I, I, I recommend that we update the guidelines. Um, cause I think that was why this was sent to us is for feedback that we update the guidelines to phase that out. I share if, if my memory serves me correct, and sometimes it doesn't, oftentimes that comes about because of community feedback where you're putting the bike lane because people rely on the streets for parking. And in order to get the bike lane, it's kind of a compromise. But, and this is just, I remember from the old days, it didn't always work. Hang on, I don't need to hear from you, Walgreens first. <laughs> There's a park protect, parking protected bike lanes as well, so you're not compromising one or the other. And that makes it extra safe for bicyclists as well. So that's also an option. Yeah, you have to have the you have to have the, the width of the road yeah, that to, to do that. Obviously, that, that, that doesn't make total sense. You just have to have enough real estate to, to, to put that in. Often on Collector, you have residential development, and people want to park their cars at night or whatever when they have guests. And, and I, I, that may, may or may not be anything to do with these, but, but I know that was often the way we were able to put bike lanes in where there were none and where it was a compromise for the community. I agree it's probably not a good idea for biking, but the, the end result may be you have no bike lane. I mean, that could be the, the neighborhood feedback. And, and so that's what these updated guidelines, I understand is updated guidelines are there to try to make our community safer. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So, and the feedback I'm giving is let's, let's make our community safer by updating this portion to phase out these type of, I, I you know, these bike lanes aren't working, you know, they, they've been tried in, in and around my community here. I'm in, I'm in district four. Um, they don't work. They, they make the community less safe. So I'd like to see this guidelines updated to phase these type of parking lanes, because there is, as we heard in a prior meeting, there is no real enforcement of these time of day restrictions for parking. And that's also just my personal uh, experience as a neighborhood association president and hearing from our residents. So I'd, I'd like to request that that be changed to convert these or and not propagate this practice of bike lanes slash parking lanes, which means it's putting these families in, in, into conflict with cars. 
Mr. Chair and uh, committee member Hermes. Uh, so hear what you're saying. It is difficult, right? Because then in those situations, then there would not be a bike lane, right? So then when what ends up happening is we go out and we want to, you know, let's say there's 20 homes along a stretch of roadway and 16 of them want bike lanes and four of them don't, right? So those become the compromise of, okay, well, we could put the bike lanes in if, right? And those types of things. So the design guidelines that Chris and his team worked on um, are only providing options. They aren't saying that you need to do one thing versus another thing. They're just laying out the options that individual communities will then make the decision about whether they want to have those types of bike lanes or not. And I hear what you're saying, right? In yeah. your situation, you would prefer not to have those in your community. And and maybe that's something that then you and your community get together. And if you as a community decide that, you know, you'd rather not have that type of facility, well, then that would be that community's decision, right? To remove those or not, where you may find that the majority of your neighbors maybe don't have the same, and I'm not saying they do or they don't, right? But that's where we would then go to the public and say, okay, well, you know, it's this, we got to try to balance everybody's needs, right? Some yeah. people want them, some people don't. And then this is a kind of clever way, whether it's effective or not, right? But it's a clever way of saying, okay, during the day, you can ride your bike, but then at night, right? When people probably aren't riding their bikes, right? Cause it's dark. Well, then people could park in front of their homes, right? For overnight parking and those types of things. So, and I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong or whatever, but right. Let's just keep in mind that this design guideline is just there to have options available for developers or city staff or, you know, different types of neighborhoods to make changes within their communities. And just tell me from community feedback, because we've, as we've heard in this committee before, there's zero enforcement of, of this policy. It means when you're, the reality is the guideline is when you're making a parking lane and a bike lane, you're not making a bike lane at all because there's cars in there. Um, and so I'd like to see it updated to see that it, this is at a minimum discouraged because of the, the lack of enforcement of this. And it, I know it, there's, there's, it's tough because resources are, are scarce and that's difficult. But I don't want to set, set up our communities for failure, and that's what's happening right now. Because um, there's, you know, when you make it, try to make something both, it doesn't do either very sure. well. Yeah. Un understood, Mr. Chair and uh, committee member, it uh, members of the subcommittee. Um, a lot of times you will hear when you hear committees like this, and you have staff come up, and you said the right word. It's enforcement, right? Most of the things that are in there have good intention. It's the enforcement behind it that maybe they don't realize their full potential, right? And it's it's anything from parking and bike lanes to speeding to automated enforcement. Like all of these things really just come down to enforcement. And as um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but at, you know he mentioned right, at, 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 yeah, <laughs> uh, he, at, at the end of the at the end of the day, right, if, if they aren't being enforced, right, we can design things to the nth degree, but if they're not enforced, right, it, it, that's where it falls down, right? So that's where I think this committee, through Vision Zero and street staff and police department and, you know, having PD here and, and those types of things, right, may help to change some of those. But again, right, I'm going to try to focus us back to the design guidelines, right, and what the intent of the design guide. And we heard your comment, and we will take that um, back. Uh, I know that they were just approved a few months ago, so I don't know that they're looking to go back out and do another overall public because to make changes right and is a pretty arduous task. But we can keep that on the on the list of things because this isn't this won't be the first or the last comment that we get about the design. They're, they're not, they aren't perfect. Right. We will try to work on them. It's a, it's a living document type of a thing. But thank you for your comment. And, you know, we'll we'll uh, We'll take that into consideration for future. You still want to go ahead. And I don't um, recall your name. Dominic. Um, so I was wondering about, since we have this new manual, uh, would that mean that roads that we already have are outdated? Committee member Spur Spurgeon. So no, um, we do have an existing roadway system. The, the the implementation is as things develop, new development comes in, uh, they would then uh, be able to utilize our guidelines on questions in terms of roadway geometry, horizontal how to construction, pavement analysis, things of that nature, 
before the roadway itself, how it's being constructed. Um, we currently have a street classification map uh, that outlines the cross sections of roadways, the classification of those roadways. Those are applied then as developments come in. That's the document that guides those uh, classifications and types of roadways that get constructed in certain areas of the city. This guideline just helps in terms of directing um, consultants and engineers to the appropriate documents or, or guidelines to be able to construct those or to design those, I should say. And uh, I have another question. So could when... you speak a little uh, more into the mic? I'm having a hard time hearing. Okay. Um, so I have another question on when you are making the manual. Um, did you just like look at cities within the U.S. Uh, or did you look at other cities maybe around different countries? So for the most part, uh, we did have a consultant on board who we asked for similar size cities uh, in population and size to be considered to look at our guidelines to maybe look at uh, ways and resources they have used uh, that we could also administer here in Phoenix. Uh, one of the main things, though, this guideline, it really does look to push you towards nationally adopted standards. And one of the, some of the things that you see that are maybe different are more specific to our climate or our topography within our state or within our, within our city. So those are the areas where maybe you'll see some guidance that maybe is different. Um, but we typically kept it uh, within, within this country. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a quick question about design speed. How did that change from the 2009 um, written document? So it actually uh, was an upgrade. Um, if you look at the 2009 up manual, we had uh, specific speeds uh, shown in there. Uh, based upon the complete streets ordinance that the council approved in 2018, uh, we were able to provide some flexibility in these guidelines now that represented the council's guidance from there. And so uh, that's reflected now in the, in the manual itself. I thought in the city council meeting, it was made clear that there wasn't any changes to the design speed in the 2023 manual. If you look into the manual now, it does provide allowances for reductions, especially in urban areas, which wasn't the case in the 2009. And so now we're able to look in urban and more dense areas to be able to have a speed at posted and the design speed as a posted speed. So that was some of the flexibility that came from council uh, with that complete streets. And so that was one of the updates again, you know, 2009 now to 2023 that we're able to provide that. So design speed was changed. There it has an allowance now in certain areas of the city to have design speed as the posted speed. Actually, and it, I can read it directly for you. Uh, city of Phoenix collector on trail streets and typologies, uh, design speeds equal to the posted speed limit plus 10 within the urban core in downtown areas may be, uh, may be provided. Chris, could you speak a little more into the microphone? Sorry. Within the urban core and downtown street typologies, the design speed may be equal to the posted speed in consultation with the street transportation department. So that was an amendment that was made from the 2009. Could, could I ask um, Brianna at some point in the future, because people refer to design speed a lot that we look at what items changing the design speed on a road would change in terms of the design of a given street. Let's, let's, take, let's take 27th Avenue as a, for instance, the one that we're discussing and say, what would a different design speed alter in the look and feel of that road so that we have some sense of the meaning of design speed on an arterial street? Could we possibly put that on a future agenda? Uh, Chair Callow, absolutely. We will make that note for a potential future agenda item. Because yeah. I myself, I couldn't even tell you everything, and I'm an engineer that worked in that, and I know it's, it is often referenced, but we don't have a good feeling for what it means. Yeah, well, sometimes you have, an op, you have a design speed, but it doesn't necessarily trans translate into your operational speed. And so that's, and then obviously then it doesn't match the posted speed limits. So those are always a problem because then you have a lot of speed variation and then you got problems, got a lot more collisions with more speed variations. So I didn't mean to jump in front of you. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Chris, what, what's the definition of an urban, what is it called again, urban area, urban uh, in here, it is called the urban core or downtown area. So within the city of Phoenix, um, we do have villages, yeah. um, 
right? And within those villages, there's urban cores designated through the general plan. And so that's meant to encapsulate those areas. I think maybe others are curious too. How far does that extend in the immediate downtown area? Uh, so the Rough, down r r r I mean, you know, roughly. Yeah, uh, typically the downtown core uh, is 7 to 7, I mean, 7th Street to 7th Avenue, uh, just south of the warehouse district up to McDowell Road is, is the, per the general plan, City of Phoenix general plan, is the downtown core. 28th Avenue, that was a big part of our discussion tonight, is not considered part of that, one of those cores. Correct. All right, okay. So the, I think we need to know. This, the conditions that some of us are interested in that we expressed tonight don't necessarily apply to some of the intersections that we've talked about tonight. So, well, that's just one aspect, right? I mean, if I'm not mistaken, that's just one aspect of design speed, or sorry, design speed equaling. I, I didn't mean, quite frankly, I haven't looked at it, so I didn't quite catch exactly <laughs> what the purpose of that was and what the update was, what it was before and what it was. And I don't want to belabor the point because we're getting, we're getting late. But I think to the point that you were making, he was just saying for this one particular item, it was specific to that corridor because that's your core of the city. Is that, am I not saying that there are other parts of the city that might have, you know, other, other issues that, you know, that could be looked at from a design standpoint? Chair and committee member, I'm sorry, I don't. Bieber. Bieber, sorry. It's, just to remember, it's, it's like Justin Bieber, <laughs> but spelled differently. So, so within the 16 different villages within the city, right? For example, uh, Paradise Valley, a core area would be Paradise Valley Mall, right? And so that's defined within the village core as a core area where you have higher densities, uh, um, increased heights, uh, more defined uses in terms of outside single family residential and so those are the areas where we meant to encapsulate within this manual that you would have potentially more flexibility because you'd have uh, lower speeds potentially in those areas, smaller block lengths, um, less or, or more congestion, right? So you're looking at maybe matching a design of a roadway that's more appropriate to the speed that's already occurring in those areas because of the designation or land use. Uh, if no one has any further comments. We do have some members of the public that would like to speak on this item, if they are still interested. Uh, Stacy Champion. Thank you. Um, so just for some historical background and in my interest in this topic, I have been paying attention and heavily involved with pedestrian cyclist uh, fatalities and safety in the city for almost 17 years now. And because of that, I remember things. And I was just thinking about uh, the Complete Streets initiative that the city passed about 10 years ago and, and just pulled up a quick, really actually well done design from 10 years ago too, uh, talking about Complete Streets. And I just wanna share this bit of of it with you. What does a complete street look like? Every complete street design is a direct response to the needs and wants of the community surrounding it. The growing set of proven design options includes those listed to the right. Add to these possibilities the unique character of each neighborhood and the exact elements that provide convenience, accessibility, comfort, and safety for everyone can be determined. That list bikeways, bike lanes, and bike racks, business front porches, shaded sidewalks, Thank dedicated you. bus lanes, comfortable and accessible public transit stops, frequent and safe crossing options, pedestrian islands, landscaping, street furniture, roundabouts. This is from 10 years ago. This is the city's plan. You know, again, like those of us are frustrated because it's it's the it's the same thing kind of over and over and over this community has expressed to the city its desire to feel safe while walking and biking for many many years now and we just want to see some real meaningful action so that's all thank you thank you committee and staff 
Um, I wanted to point out that city council, when they discussed this, um, the reason why it's here today for you guys is because Councilwoman Pastor asked that it come through Vision Zero Committee, all right, the advisory committee. Um, and instead, prior, it went through some obscure uh, committee in planning that really doesn't have the experience that you guys have in dealing with this type of um, uh, topic. So it's here today. And one of the other things, if you go back and watch, I believe it was the July um, council meeting, one of the many, that this, your, your recommendations for possible amendments, because that's what passed recently were amendments to this design guideline. Um, those recommendations you make, unfortunately, will go through staff in a, a forum, a committee of their own, to determine if they even want to bring it to council. I advise you guys to definitely write a letter of your re recommendations if you do make amendments. Um, we don't need that much red tape anymore. We're past that. Um, so, and also I want to say that um, when it was brought up about balancing the needs um, of various stakeholders, what are we talking about? The needs of the privileged versus the not, you know? Um, that's something we keep bringing up as well. And another aspect to this, looking at my time, um, you guys, one of the, these type of topics should also be brought up to the Mayor's Commission on um, Disability Issues. And I've attended those meetings and I've had brought up discussions to where they then bring out Streets Department. And one of the things that this does not have in it, the design manual, and I actually I hope I'm wrong, because it is a very long and lengthy design manual. It's some of the ADA needs that we need to incorporate, which is not putting utilities and poles any, any longer in the sidewalks. Like we saw with Indian School and 7th Ave Avenue, you guys. Um, we need to think better about that. And that's one of my recommendations for amendments here. Um, I'll go ahead and cut it off with that. But there's a lot of different ADA um, issues that we're not considering in this design manual with a very terse, brief presentation. Thank you, Thank you Nicole. Okay, that was information and discussion, and we, have we had enough? Does anybody have any more items they want to talk about? I don't want to shut anybody off. Uh, if so, the next item, which is request for future agenda items. Uh, does anyone have any? Yes, Jay. Uh, just to reiterate what we so spoke about um, earlier this uh, in this meeting uh, three and a half years ago, um, we... Uh, we uh, we had made a request for some uh, whether it's a report back or somebody to show up and, and talk about the subcommittee. So if you would please have that on a, on an agenda item as a specific thing. Um, also, and and we discussed this through email, is that I had made a request at um, a previous meeting uh, that we get a report back on how uh, how the data uh, with regards to collisions and and uh, I guess it's uh, streets. Uh, the police department are, are going to come in and give us a presentation on how how they collect data from a collision and that, and what that goes into and where that data resides and all that kind of stuff. So um, if we could uh, just want to make sure that that was going to be on an agenda item as well. So. Uh, Chair Callow and committee member Bieber. Um, yes, we, I had actually um, spoke with the police department to see we were hoping they'd be able, because that one was actually on uh, the list prior to the design manual. Unfortunately, the police department, um, some of their key members weren't able to um, prepare everything in time because they had um, been out of the office. So they are committed to coming in the December meeting to provide right. all of that information. Can I, quick question, I had, I had requested uh, or asked previously um, in Keeney, I had mentioned that we, we brought back about the community's ability to recommend ordinances um, specifically for, um, you know, for enforcement of hazardous objects in the bikeway, namely vehicles um, in front of schools and other areas uh, citywide. And he said that would be brought back at some point. I just wanted to follow up on that to see um, if that was something we could, you know, address soon. Can't hear you guys. Council's on mute.
Council chambers are on mute. I wonder what's going on. Okay, so in, in terms of, um, so obviously this group is an advisory body, right? And so you guys are able to make recommendations um, per the ordinance. Any recommendations that come out of this committee would then go to the executive task force. It is the executive task force that reviews and would make the determination if something would move forward and get on a future council council agenda. So. Mm -hmm. that that is how the, the process is set up in terms of you guys are advisory you can make recommendations all those recommendations go to the executive task force and it is their determination on whether to place it on a council agenda <laughs> okay yeah, and, and i would just, i would just point out just to some of the other conversation that we've had is the only way that that could happen and i'm not saying i'm for or against any of this but um it would need to be an agenda item and it would need to be an action item Correct. In order for us to make up. Yeah, so can I recommend, can I request a, that be added to the next agenda as an action item to discuss, you know, drafting, you know, potential ordinance for, uh, you know, enforcement of the bikeways. Uh, Dan, Dan, there is already a ordinance in effect for enforcement of all parking regulations. If that's what you're discussing. I think what you're looking for is someone to actually implement and carry out that. That, this, would uh, that be, this, would, this would be citizen citizen reporting. So people citizen who are out there, yeah, so people who are out there riding their bikes or on the streets that see this can take pictures and send them into the streets or whatever this whatever met avenue, you know, whatever direction it's set up. But there's several states um, like New York City. Um, they've drafted legislation that and it implemented ordinances that you know allow allows for citizen reporting of uh, bikeway uh, obstructions, mainly vehicles, and that gets, you know, gets moved onto the, the streets department or police, whoever in, enforces that. And um, I have, you know, this isn't the time and place right now to go into the whole details, but I just like to discuss it at a future date. Okay. Uh, and I know we couldn't get by an item without you. Thank you, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it, Chair. Uh, two for future agenda items. One, uh, leading pedestrian intervals. Would love an update on where we are with that and implementing that. You know, citywide. Just where are we and where are we going when it comes to leading pedestrian intervals? I'm a, I'm a big fan. It's you know practically saved my life a few times. Um, and second item would be um, what are we doing with with our with our school districts to promote um, safe routes to school? I know. Is reviewing the road safety action plan. It talks about schools a lot. Um, would love to, to talk about that in more detail with what are we doing when it comes to schools. I got little kids, uh, uh, daughters of mine who are in, mm -hmm. in our schools and serve on the public school board um, in, in my area. And would just love a discussion specifically about schools and promoting uh, mm -hmm. Safe Routes to School. I was just reading some data that 30 years ago used to be 70% of kids will, would, and families would walk to school. Um, now it's flipped and it's more like 80% drive to school and don't feel safe walking to school. So we'd love to have a specific discussion about that and what, what we're doing around that serious issue. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I would like to see if we are able to look more into the community outreach and uh, if we're able to make that a possibility. Um, yeah. And we are an advisory board. Remember, we don't, uh, it's kind of like stretching what we're doing, but we'll let them get back to us on that. Anything else? Just to that point, you know, to me, community outreach takes on many forms. 
And that could include, you know, public awareness, you know, it, 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 in the end, is there a public awareness component that's going to come out of, you know, and if that's the case, I think that'd be good for us to know because, you know, that again, that's all part of, it seems to me, all part of the, the community awareness uh, or community outreach strategy. So. Anyone else? I have okay. a question. Who? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, so is that okay for me to reach out the uh, um, consulate woman, Guardado? You can do anything you want on your own. You just don't represent that you are speaking on behalf of the committee. You are just speaking as an individual. So, I mean, you can reach out to people. You can talk to people. You can bring those ideas into your own thinking. But you can't say you are there on behalf of the committee and you represent the, the whole committee. That's all you can do. Mm, okay. Would that you. be about right, Brianna? Uh, I can tell you as a cyclist, I know, you know, I have the same, there might be other people with the same thing. We hear from the public all the time, uh, usually with one finger. <laughs> it's, it's pretty pervasive. <laughs> okay, with that, we have uh, public comment, and uh, I'm going to mix it up and let uh, Nicole go first this time. <laughs> This is the, the last agenda item. Is my oh, yeah, this is actually anything you want to talk about for two minutes. Any, oh, hey, all right. Related, related, related to this. Well, okay. this is about this for two minutes. <laughs> um, well, thank you again. And I know it's late, and I'll do my best to keep it within two minutes. You might hear me walking away still talking, though, okay? Um, I was really curious. I was glad uh, that uh, Chairman, our uh, committee member, Hermes brought this up. I want to know how that rocket science study is going on leading pedestrian intervals with ASU. Um, that is something that we brought up early on. If y'all don't remember, it was uh, at one of the meetings. I believe it was the last virtual meeting. Um, I was really surprised to hear that that was actually needing a study when it's well studied already and that it does, it is proven to save lives. Um, and, and with that too, I, you know, there's just a lot of um, continued kind of issues I hear over and over, um, and I, I'm trying my best to digest what I keep hearing from, from staff and others, um, but something that we still need to understand is that, I mean, uh, the gentleman that brought up 15-minute cities, I don't know what kind of Kool-Aid that is, but to be honest, we're trying to make things accessible for anybody, for any user. I brought up people that are from the disability uh, mobility um, community. No one's here talking about that, right? Um, so. We're talking about folks that are not just in their vehicles, but also people driving their vehicles are at high risk too with our roadway design. They are dying quite a bit as well. Um, so this is not car versus bike. So please stop bringing up 15 minute city because I could go on forever on that more than 15 minutes. So what we need to do is be collaborative on this. And I think from this, we have great playbooks that keep, they're, they're being brought up. And you know, not to harp on the aspect of Google it, but it is all out there, you guys. So um, please start taking action and you know, not to, to, uh, to be rude to staff, but please push back. Um, and I hope our new leadership supports them on making improvements, because I do believe that's where it comes from. Thank you. Stacey Champion. In the first seven months of 2023, 136 pedestrians and cyclists have died in Maricopa County, with the majority of these deaths happening on our dangerous by design city of Phoenix streets. Eight-year-old Jarrell, who was killed in a hit and run. 71-year-old Thomas, who was killed along with his dog in a marked crosswalk. A 14-year-old who was struck and killed while riding his bike. Apparently charges against the driver are pending, but meanwhile someone's son is dead because he was doing something every kid should be able to do, riding his bike. The city's lack of political will to focus on people versus convenience is literally killing people. We have fast moving multi-lane virtual highways running through our neighborhoods. It's long past time for Phoenix to kill the suicide lanes on 7th Street and 7th Ave that were initiated in the late 70s, early 80s, before the 51 was even there and pre tons of development, development along the 7s. They are deadly and dangerous and need to go. It's past time for Phoenix to actually start implementing complete streets 
where people are moving, not just focusing on people recreating. It's time for the city to grow a spine, show some real leadership, and start caring about more than just cars. I strongly encourage this committee to host a screening of the Street Project documentary to learn about real world solutions to protect all public road users, not just those in cars. And yes, this committee should have subcommittees. As somebody who has been on numerous committees, like that is absolutely bonkers to me. Like every committee has subcommittees and the subcommittee members who are really passionate do the work and don't need staff and bring it back and report to the full committee. I mean, that is just crazy to me that you guys are trying to stop them from doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have no other uh, names of anyone that would like to speak. Uh, I have no more agenda items. I have one final request from staff. Um, this is more of a general thing. Um, there has been some things brought up during this uh, discussion, especially in public comment, about getting materials to the public uh, as early as possible. So, again, similar to the request for the speed limits and, and whatever that comes uh, just for the council, um, anything that we're going to talk about here, whatever opportunity there is to get that out to the public as early as possible, I think I know the public would, would appreciate that. And, um, you know, I'm really big on transparency and letting the, you know, having, having the public know what's going on as, as we are part of the public. So, so thank you for whatever you can do to facilitate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, I would re accept a request to adjourn the meeting. So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Uh, anyone opposed? I know you're looking at me. I know you can't vote, but you're smiling, so we're okay. <laughs>